And now, ladies and gentlemen, you are entering New York's greatest place for all things film. Starring your host, Tommy Smart. Your co-host, DJ Gowski. Your head of reviews, Brother Wells. And your news anchor, Haley Marks. We now enter the studios to bring you The Screening Room on WRHU. Good morning. This is Thomas Smart, live in New York. Gowski is bringing me to you via the magic of WRHU 88.7 FM to bring you yet another hour of fun and adventure here with all that is cinema here on WRHU. Like I haven't said that 12 times. But anyway, of course, it's about, what was it, the 20th, correct? And then we've got so much going on today. It's going to be so much fun. Anyway, I'll get right into it. So pretty much today, guys, we have, what, what we got today? We got basically reviews on Everest, Black Mass, mm, and, and the Maze, Maze, Runner. Maze Runner, which I didn't even like the first one. Why are we reviewing the second one? <laughs> all right, because it's like a big, yeah. so it's a big Hollywood blockbuster. We got two heavy hits. It's going to be the new Hunger game. We got two heavy hitters today, though. You're trying to build that as a new Hunger Games, and you just know they're all terrible. But we'll uh, see if this one is. But I mean, you know what I mean. Every of course. One of these. Of course. <laughs> it's just like these based off of novels about dystopian future. These kids basically stop overthrowing an evil empire. It's, it's all too much to handle. But you know how everybody loves this stuff, so we do it anyway. Of course. And then, of course... Get, later on in the show, actually, we have this new guy named uh, Ari Boyland, mm-hmm. who's gonna... He's basically in this new movie called... Oh, what was it? Blood Punch. Which, punch. No, it's not Jungle Juice. It's like Blood Punch. Apparently, that's a thing. <laughs> I mentioned that, like, if you're at like a senior prom, going, "Hey, honey, want me to get you some Blood Punch?" Oh yeah, I love that stuff. <laughs> some more. <laughs> He's like funny. I hope no. it's not based off an actual drink concoction. Like, <laughs> well, I mean, that'd be funny if it did, right? Just have like a high school mm. cocktail at your prom. That'd be nice. That'd be funny. Like a, Everything else, like a horror action <laughs> film or something. Like well, that. yeah, that's the thing about it. It's oh, like it's a blade or something. <laughs> it's funny. So I talked to this guy, Ari Boylan. He's from New Zealand. He's an he's an actor, mm-hmm. actually. And yeah, he basically tells me that this um, blood punch is like a film noir meets black comedy meets kind of like horror indie. Raunchy. Yeah, I knew the horror was like, in there. <laughs> well, yeah, it would have to be. No, no, this is like. Mm-hmm. Wait, wait, wait till I just like play this later in the show because this guy, mm-hmm. he's he's a chill dude. He's a chill dude, but I'll be up later in the show. We'll have more fun with that. And you know, guys, I gotta talk about Creed later on. Oh my mm-hmm. god, yeah. They, so then they just they came out with a new trailer, right? Oh yeah, yeah, new trailer. And of course, you got two of those, mo- two uh, basically two of them now. And this is like a Rocky spin. This is huge controversy. Is it a Rocky spinoff? Is it its own movie? You know. It, you know, we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. But we're going to talk about that later in the show, and it'll be fun. Anyway, it's going to be fun. How was your weekend, Tommy? Was my weekend? Uh, what did I do? Uh, basically, pretty much, I'm trying to write my senior film, which is like, mm, you know about that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Eh, it's going to be very Bruce Springsteen. So if I ever get... Medell was asking me the other day. It was funny. Medell was asking me, and basically said... So when do you think it's going to be done shooting? I mean, yeah, if I ever get through the script, it'll be, it'll be done sooner or later. Hey, we got one later. thing at a time. I mean, I don't know. You could probably do it, like, probably next year, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, probably next year. No, it'll be great. It'll be great. Mm. Why? What did you do? Mm. What? Whoa, whoa, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you put me on the spot, bro. Like, um, no, it's cool. I went to New York City last night. Oh, word. That's I was out till like, 2 in the morning. Oh, and so I was still awake for this show, which is awesome. Whoa. And, um... Whatever you know, twenty-one-year-olds like to do in the city is what I did. So <laughs> that's sweet. No. Yeah. So what was that more like NBC stuff, or was it just like? Oh no, no, this is just like chilling, chilling. Yeah, chilling. Of course, yeah, of course. Uh, 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 uh. Joy, this is, um, Haley Marks isn't here. She's um, being filled in by Joy Jones, so our new no news person today. So how's it going, Joy? It's going good. What about you? Yeah, chill. Pretty sweet. So what did you do? It's always chill. <laughs> <laughs> put everyone on the spot. Yeah, too. we're going to put everyone on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do this week? Oh, what did I do? I don't really remember. Not that <laughs> I would have reason not to remember. Sounds like oh, a good okay, time. Of course. <laughs> you remember. Oh, wait. I went shopping. That's what I did. Shopping. Ooh, what did you buy? I bought clothes. I bought new pots for my plants. Mm. And I bought groceries. That sounds fun. Mm. Good times. We're so exciting, right? College kids. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you could just go to like a grocery store. Actually, this would be yeah. me one day. Just like go get like Angry Orchards because I love Angry Orchards. That's and funny. then like a cake or like cake? brownies. Just a giant cake. Because like, why the heck not? Like, well, if you like that stuff, it's all good. So probably. I don't know. I mean, it is. That is true. All right. College so of course, we, from wherever we do, we all gather to do talk about movies. That'll be fun. I want to talk about this. Maze Runner Scorch Trials Sprint's Bass Black Mass apparently now apparently they did better at the box office apparently than that, and they did more. oh yeah I mean it's bigger production scale it's a YA film of course it's gonna be at the top yeah cause really mm-hmm. I guess it's his gangster pictures really don't have the draw that they used to 
Yeah, I, well, I mean, yeah, if you back in the day, I mean, was it? I think like Goodfellas, like shot up to like number one at first, and then well, that was also two. we also had like Marty Scorsese directing, mm -hmm. Bob De Niro acting, that right. kind of like power couple mm -hmm. does that good stuff. But mm -hmm. yeah, I guess it just means that all these like movies about you know all these basically big blockbusters about dystopian future, the kids, mm -hmm. a bunch of kids save the world. I guess that's a bigger draw. It's crazy, mm -hmm. sad. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we'll talk about more stuff like that when we get later on this show. That'll be more fun time here. But first, anyway, Joy, what we got for news? When we get back. Well, Disney reportedly wants Emily Blunt to star in the new Mary Poppins movie. Paul Feig's Ghostbusters reboot will feature three of the four members of the original busting gang. And Brian Singer signs on to direct a theatrical adaptation of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. For all that and more, stay tuned to the screening room. Back to you, Tommy. Thank you, Joy. Thank you. Wow, Emily Blunt. I love that last name. Mm -hmm. But, you know, yeah. when we get back, we'll basically have Ari Boylan. I'll play this pre-taped interview, and we'll see why Blood Punch is such is right movie for you. And when we get back, we have that and more here on The Screening Room. So, just stay tuned. We'll be right back. Nostalgia seems to be the theme for 2015 reboots, and next summer's sequel to 80s comedy Ghostbusters will be no different. Bill Murray, Dan Aykroyd, and Ernie Hudson are all set to appear in Paul Feig's new Ghostbusters. The three stars will cameo as characters other than members of the original Ghostbusters gang, with the exception of Rick Moranis, who retired from acting in 1997. Ghostbusters starring Kristen Wiig, Melissa McCarthy, Leslie Jones, and Kate McKinnon will be released on July 15, 2016. Walt Disney Pictures' 1964 movie musical Mary Poppins was an instant classic for fans and continues to live on today. With the news that Rob Marshall plans to bring the infamous British nanny back for a new Mary Poppins movie, fans are already speculating who will play Poppins. Emily Blunt is the rumored favorite for Disney, though nothing has been officially confirmed nor denied by the studio. Blunt is a popular pick these days, plus it certainly helps that director Marshall worked with Blunt before in Into the Woods. The new movie takes place 20 years after the first film does, as it is based on a sequel novel to the original Mary Poppins series. However, the new movie is neither a sequel nor a reboot. There is no scheduled release date for the new Mary Poppins movie. In the world of sci-fi, Joel Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea is a definite classic. Brian Singer, who is most famous for directing the X-Men franchise, just finished writing a script with Dan Studney and Rick Sordelay. Singer will also direct the film after concluding production of X-Men Apocalypse. Joel Verne's classic has had several film adaptations, with the 1954 version of 20,000 Leagues being the most notorious. That's all for now. Stay tuned for more on the latest in film news. And, of course, as always, we're back here on the screening room, and we're going to be talking to Ari Boyland before we talk about him. But I wanted to say this movie, Blood Punch, it's basically when all the basically, got, get this, you guys know about the Austin Film Festival? Anybody? Mm -hmm. Anybody? Ari, yeah, this thing's yeah, like, yeah. apparently so in Texas, you have so many different states in America that actually are really big into film. Basically, you have L.A., obviously, you have some in New York, and apparently Atlanta, too. I mean, everybody is from Atlanta. Yeah, Apparently, a little bit. I've yeah, heard yeah, some yeah, I've heard some. Yeah, I, I think it was like last year more movies were shot in Atlanta than there actually yeah. were. Yeah, actually, Atlanta. my aunt wrote a script that went to a film festival in Atlanta. So. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, no, they have it. Bravo. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow, really? Mm-hmm. That was quite Yeah, it was about the DeBarge family. Oh. Hmm. What are they? Oh, they were a famous music group back in the day, but that's beside the point. Uh, yeah, yeah, but it's just like funny. Yeah, so <laughs> basically when you have in Austin, you have basically you have what was the University of Texas at Austin, and they have a really big film school, and also just like that entire Texas feel has more of an indie resurgence of sure. filmmaking over there. So yeah, they have this huge fe film festival called uh, Austin Film Festival, and this movie, Blood Punch, which is basically like a indie horror, noir, dark comedy all of the above, what's called it. It's a potpourri of a genre, anyway. So basically, this guy was telling me about it, and I like doing interviews pre-taped. I'm not gonna lie, I like him doing pre-tapes just so I can like talk to him more about stuff. But anyway, I want to play this. Ari Boylan, he's from New Zealand, by the way. So I love this dude's accent. So we'll just play that, Galski. So Ari, tell me a little bit about this movie Blood Punch because it's kind of a creepy trailer. <laughs> That's a good way to describe it. It's a, it's a twisted little movie. It's not your normal uh, sit down. Um, kind of veg out movie you, uh, you really want to watch it with a group of friends 
maybe have a couple of beers. It's a lot of fun. It's uh, it's very different to anything that's that's come out uh, recently, and definitely different to anything that I've done. Um, it is actually available on demand right now. It was released on the 1st of September, um, so on iTunes and Amazon, and basically any platform that you can find in North America uh, that's renting out movies, whether it's PlayStation or Xbox or anything like that. Um, but yeah, basically there were there are three lead characters in it. All of us are from New Zealand. Uh, the writer um, and director partnership uh, were the creative team on the season of Power Rangers RPM that we all shot together in New Zealand. A very weird meeting place for this movie to come in its inception, but basically they were um, they were writers on kids animation for a very long time uh, and had always wanted to make a film. And obviously from kids animation it led them to write a horror slash, slash thriller film. Um, yeah, so <laughs> it's, it's pretty twisted, um, but a lot of fun, a huge amount of fun. So tell me more about your actual involvement. How did you get involved with the project? Um, so we all met, we were working on uh, Power Rangers in New Zealand. We shot a season of that. Um, the way that they make that show is basically they recast every season and completely reboot the storyline. So we all met on uh, Power Rangers in New Zealand, and Eddie came to us about, uh, about a year later uh, with a script saying, hey, I wrote this for you guys. Would you come over to the States and, and shoot this? And we were like, um, let me think about that for a second. Hmm. Hell yes. Um, yeah, so we all hopped on a plane, came over, shot some test footage in 2011, uh, and then came back pretty much a year later and started Principal Photography and have been best of friends ever since. And focusing on you a little bit, I want to talk about you because you started as an actor back in New Zealand. Is that correct? Yeah, I am. I am, yes. Um, we have a thriving film industry there and have done for a very long time. I actually started um, on a on a kids' TV show that was made for the international market in what was it 1999, so pretty much the exact same time that they started filming Lord of the Rings. Uh, we actually lost half of our crew from the first season to the second because of Lord of the Rings. They all left and went there. So roughly around the same time that that really massive international boom hit the film industry in New Zealand, uh, we were we were working on things there as well. Now, was that a bummer? Were you trying to get on Lord of the Rings? <laughs> I don't think I really knew what Lord of the Rings was at the time. I was only ten years old. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I, it was it was amazing for the for the entire industry in Wellington, which is where I'm from, which is where Lord of the Rings was based. Um, it really just it boomed after that. So it was a fantastic thing for the New Zealand economy and for the film industry in New Zealand, and, and ever since, really. I mean, James Cameron's just moved his entire family and production studios and everything over there as well. Um, so it's, it's been great. And focusing on you specifically a little bit more now, you were actually influenced to act by one teacher in school. Who was that teacher? Uh, his name was Mr. Greg Pierce. Um, I'm actually still in contact with him uh, quite a bit. And he was so instrumental in, in me getting involved in performing arts. We would have... He actually managed to create something where on every Thursday, the entire day would be for a select group of people that he'd pull out of class. The entire day was a performing arts extension group, um, which is really unheard of, especially in a public school. Um, and it really just kind of created an environment that, that nurtured um, any potential that, that I had to just kind of explore and be creative and free and really set me up to to go that route and actually the, the part that I got on the tribe which was the kids show that I did the first one uh, they were casting through schools because the entire show takes place solely with adolescents the basic storyline is that um, all of the adults over the age of like 18 get wiped out by a virus so it's kind of like Mad Max meets Lord of the Flies huh. and people start dyeing their hair crazy colours and painting their faces and forming these groups that they live in and yeah, it was an amazing, it was an amazing storyline. Um, but yeah, they were casting it through the schools, and I was put forward for an audition by this teacher, um, Mr. Pierce, and yeah, the rest is history, I suppose. So I guess that changed your life then. Like the... Yeah, completely. I mean, I went from being a regular kid in school at the age of ten to for the next three years, for six months at a time, I was full time on a on an internationally produced TV show. Um, so <laughs> I think I kind of got to the end of that. I was about 13 and I realized I kind of was missing my friends and wanted to go back to school, so I left and, and did that and periodically went off and shot other things, but it wasn't really until I was about 18 that I really seriously um, started pursuing it again. 
And tell me about this production specifically. How was it? It's a good time. Um, it was very different because I was obviously much more involved all the way from its inception. Um, because as I say, these characters were written specifically for us as actors, which wow. never happens, you know. So, in terms of the creative input that we had, um, we really had a lot of free reign um, to explore the characters and create this world. Um, but also, yeah, I mean, we were kind of. It's weird. We were kind of sitting somewhere in between like an acting slash producing slash anything role on this film. While we did have a full professional crew, crew doing it, um, we kind of, yeah, we, we were just helping out any way we could. And there were days where I was running around on set where I wasn't actually shooting. I was I was doing craft services and making sure all the crew had food and water and all that kind of stuff. As, as you have to on a low-budget uh, independent film. Um, but, I mean, we knew right from the, right from the get-go from reading the script that, it was something special. It was something really special that that was just going to turn out amazingly. And I mean, by all accounts, it really has. We we've had an incredible response in the film festival circuit. Uh, we won yeah, like ten awards with like nineteen nominations. Um, it's it's been an amazing, amazingly rewarding experience. I can't get over the fact that you were actually crafty on set. I think I think that's indicative of the uh, of the mentality of the. Of New Zealanders in general, but also just the film crew. Like, I'm I'm used to in New Zealand. Like, my my caravan or my trailer is a, is an apple box in the corner of the set that I just go and sit on. So I'm I'm very low maintenance and and just kind of keen to get it down and dirty and involved in any way that I can to to get what we're doing made. So let me ask you: if you had to compare this movie to some, because you know how Hollywood loves to compare like a new script. And compare it to a new to a movie that's done successfully really well. If you had to compare this movie to another film, what would you compare it to? I think I think the best um, comparison that I have heard is Groundhog Day meets Blood Simple, the right. Coen Brothers' first film. Right. Uh, so there's a kind of that noirish feel to it, um, with kind of. Yeah, you know, it just cre- it really creates this world that you're sucked into, but it also has this supernatural twist. Um, it's kind of like a dangerous love triangle, so there's like a double indemnity kind of feel in there as well. Right, right. Um, it's it's such a it's such a mashup of so many different genres. It's hard to place it, but I think Blood Simple Groundhog Day is a is a very very good example of, of what it is. Oh, bro, I love that you know about double indemnity. I mean, like, who knows about movies like that? You know. Well, yeah, we did it. We did a huge amount of research for this. Um, uh, Eddie, the writer, would send us through um, material to watch and to research for these characters that he had in mind, and we, we did a lot of a lot of watching of noir because it is it is a very specific genre, and it is also very a, a very specifically American genre as well. Um, so it was. I mean, everybody knows that kind of you know that smoky room with a private eye investigator, like that kind of feel. But to really give that uh, a lived-in feeling um, as an actor, it, it yeah, it, it required a lot of research and, and actually really watching things and, that have been successful and how we could not necessarily replicate, but kind of take on some of those aspects and insert it into a new modern feel. Because it really is neo-noir. It's not like a film noir. It's, um, it's, recy- yeah, it's, just, it's a recycling. Yeah, so yeah, me- kind of. But, but in the same time, Everything about the story is completely original, mm-hmm. which doesn't really happen very frequently with films that get released now, unless you're going to like Korean film or something like that, which is just totally off the wall and and totally removed from Western storytelling. Right. Um, which was what attracted me so much, other than being offered the role, obviously. But what attracted me so much to the script was that I was left there sitting at the end of it, going, "What the hell just happened?" Because it was nothing like anything. I mean, it's closer to kind of like what Tarantino's doing with like grindhouse films or like, right, right. Um, you know, that kind of thing. It was, it was very, very different. And this movie premiered at the Austin Film Festival. Were you there for that? Because that can be a lot of fun. I was indeed, yeah. That was an amazing experience. It was a first film festival. It was our world premiere. Um, yeah, it was It was really well received. It was, uh, it was an amazing place to be. And Austin in general is just an awesome city. It is so much fun. And tell me, what exactly are you doing when you're at these things? Because I'm sure there was a lot of networking you had to do for the movie. We had a very efficient guerrilla marketing strategy mm-hmm. uh, at all the film festivals that we went to. We had um, 
we had cool little giveaways. We had like uh, little match boxes because um, one of the things of the film is that um, one of the lead characters, Skylar, is continuously smoking and she's smoking using uh, strike anywhere matches that she strikes with her thumb. So we had these little little packets of matches that we were like match boxes that we'd go and leave around the place that had like blood punch written on it with like cool little designs. We had little wristbands. We had flyers that we were handing out. We would go and just set up anywhere. We'd also do things of like getting um, little mini projectors mm-hmm. and we'd like wherever we'd be like if there was like some kind of an event or something like that, we'd just set it up in the corner and like blast blood punch up onto the wall <laughs> just using like a little projector. Um, but it's really interesting. That's, that was a really interesting part of the film festival process is getting people to come and see your films and then also seeing all of this amazingly um, creative work that you're seeing literally in its um, introduction to the world. Um, so it, it, it's, it's an amazing environment. Any film festival that you go to, specifically Austin, because the community as a whole are so into it, um, there's just some amazing work that you can see that no one else has seen, um, that, that no one else has seen yet that is on yeah. the path that you've seen by other people. So I had an incredible time at Austin and all the festivals that we went to. Hey, yo, yo, if you're just tuning in, you're talking. I'm talking to uh, Ari Boland. He's the actor, one of the lead actors in the new movie Blood Punch, which is on VOD right now, and it won big at the Austin Film Festival. But that right, Ari, is there anywhere else you can check out this picture? It is indeed. Well, I mean, it's yeah. at the moment, it's just VOD in North America, so Canada included. Um, but obviously, if you're international and you can create an American iTunes account, um, then you can get it through that. Um I'm sure eventually it will end up on Netflix, but at this stage, that's kind of like the last step, I think, on the in the in the line. Um, yeah, so at this stage, it's all just VOD. We had a we had a brief screening uh, at a cinema here in Los Angeles in Hollywood um, that we was actually a prize from the Dances with Films Award that we won from the film festival here in, in Hollywood. Um, but yeah, basically, right now, VOD, iTunes, Amazon, Xbox, PlayStation. Anything that you can stream things from, you'll be able to find Blood Punch. The movie is Blood Punch, and the guest on the screen room today is Ari Boylan, one of the lead actors in the film. Anyway, it's a great movie. i got to tell everybody to check it out because it is substantial. It is like a film noir, dark comedy, everything you can possibly want in a picture of this kind. And I'm just going to reiterate, it really is a party film. Get together with your friends, have some drinks, have a, have a laugh. It's, it's a lot of fun. No, and it'll play, with your, it'll, it'll play with your head. Can I just say I love how you actually condone drinking in order to enjoy the actual movie? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. So, yeah, check it out anytime. Ari, thanks so much for being here. Appreciate it. Fantastic. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. No problem. Later. Yeah. So, Ari Boyland, great guy. Australian, actually. Mm. So, yeah, Blood Punch, good movie. Should be good. Yeah. You can enjoy it if you want to. It's on VOD, so everybody can check that out. readily available to you if you guys want to. But that should be fun and everything like that. So, that's cool. That's cool. Anyway, so yeah, that's basically what I have right here for you right now. And then when we get back, we'll talk more about basically Creed. So I want to talk about that. We got a little clip from Stallone talking about it. So I want to talk about Creed in terms of whether or not it's actually like a Rocky spinoff or is it a Rocky sequel. Because really, this is Rocky 7, no matter what anybody says. That's my mind. That's my mind. And then we have this basically, you ever hear about this? Basically, you can stream any movie in the world, but actually, for free, but actually, that would be illegal. Guess what? Apparently, that is. Apparently, that's a thing. Mm-hmm. So, of course, that's apparently, fair. there's actually this thing called popcorn time. Popcorn time. Should we hear that, Galski? I actually time? have heard about it. I mean, but yeah, I heard about it, too. Usually, mm-hmm. there's other... I mean, this is definitely one of the bigger websites. I mean, there's obviously been references to other websites, but yeah. I've heard of it. It's so, got a cute logo. Cute logo. I know, I know. Right? It's got, like, it's the popcorn with the eyes. Thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's got the little pop, box of popcorn with the eyes. Yeah, it's yeah, cute. It's, it's cute. So, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, because I've got to tell you, this entire streaming thing... Mm-hmm. Streaming is the way of the future. I said that many times in this show. Uh, I use it all the time. Oh yeah, all the time. Even mm-hmm. he knows that. Mm-hmm. God knows Mandela knows. So we're gonna talk about <laughs> so that. When we get man. back here. But when we get back here, when we have more fun here on the screen room on W R H U. A true story with a powerful message. Captive tells the life story of Ashley Smith. Kate Mara stars as Ashley Smith, a recovering drug addict held hostage in her own home by murderer Brian Nichols. 
Smith survives and evades death after reading a Christian novel to Nichols. In addition to this chilling episode, Smith must endure the death of her husband, who was murdered. Smith's struggle with drug drugs causes her to lose custody of her daughter. After the accursing ordeal, Smith says he was a sinner saved by God, just like me and everyone else. Mara says there's a lot of hope in Captive. Someone who thought her life was over for a very long time found herself in a very intense situation. Oscar winner David Oyeloa takes on the role of Brian Nichols. Captive, rated PG-13, is in theaters now. And now the latest update on the Divergent franchise. The third installment is underway. Shailene Woodley and Theo James tackle their fears once again. The power duo Beatrice Pryor and Tobias Eden get past the wall in closing Chicago and venture to the dangerous outside world. Woodley remarks that filming was an adventure in itself as she reflects, I was walking backwards and holding onto Theo's shoulder like it was the last thing. The film was shot in Atlanta, which made the heat a contributing factor to the treacherous shoot. The third installment in the Divergent series, Allegion, hits theaters March 18th, 2016. And the fifth wave trailer has been released. Critics are describing it as a cross between The Hunger Games and The Road. The film stars Chloe Moretz as a high school student that saves her brother from the villains after four waves have wiped out the human population. The first wave takes out the power, the second is an earthquake, the third a widespread of disease, and the fourth the villainous other referred to as they. The trailer depicts they, the villains, wreaking havoc on society. Despite the evil forces, Moretz Moretz's character Casey is determined to save her brother. The film is based off of Rick Yancey's young adult novel, Infinite Sea. The thriller hits theaters this January. That's all for now. Stay tuned for more on the latest in film news. It's Tommy Smart, live in New York. Galski's bringing me to UV and the magic of WRHU 88.7 FM. Anyway, so can you believe that whole Sean and Atlanta thing? It's a big thing now. Apparently, it's really yeah, it is. Yeah. The only thing I knew that is Sean and Atlanta. It's not even a movie. It was The Walking Dead. Yeah, it's a TV show. Well, I mean, it was still a good Team Wolf TV was show. actually uh, Wolf. shot in Atlanta for a little bit. Yeah, it's um, mm-hmm. when I entered in LA, basically. They're shooting one of their projects out in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. So I just thought it was cool. Oh, it's great. Cool. Yeah, it's a good place to no, shoot. Honestly. Nice yeah. city. Beautiful city, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah, I've only been there in the airport. I went there this summer, actually. Oh, cool. Mm-hmm. It was, uh, yeah, like a very, it's a very big city, I mean, mm-hmm. and a big airport, too, that's for sure. So I just love those, those huge airports. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I got to talk about, uh, I want to talk about, before we wrap this up, I want to talk about popcorn time. I want to talk about Creed, but first maybe Creed. So, I mean, everybody knows the Rocky franchise, how that's been in six movies. First picture won Best Picture at the Oscars. It was an underdog. Uh, semi-autobiographical of Stallone's life, where basically he's a down-and-out screenwriter in real life, and mm. his alter ego, Rocky, is a down-and-out boxer in real life. Mm. He gets, gets a shot to be heavyweight champion of the world, and he goes the distance, <laughs> loses, but still gains some glory. And what's amazing about that franchise is that it's one of the most fully realized characters in cinema. You have a character that basically you go through every stage of his life, and really, I gotta say, Rocky's life, if you analyze it, it's really depressing. Mm-hmm. I mean, think about it. Yeah. He's basically, <laughs> he's broke. <laughs> In the first movie, <laughs> he's broke. Mm-hmm. He's, uh, basically, everybody thinks he's a bum. That's the big thing. Ooh, okay. He's a bum. And then, he, go, he goes through that, he basically makes a lot of money during the fight. Mm-hmm. He gets basically beaten up every single movie mm-hmm. he like wins the heavyweight championship he loses, loses it loses his friend in the ring oh yeah has, yeah yeah that's right mm-hmm. Apollo Creed dies mm-hmm. <laughs> and then spoiler. right um, yeah spoiler and then basically he's in the sixth movie apparently his wife dies mm. and now he's kind of back into this movie Creed which is interesting because everybody knows if you ever seen the trailer which you'll check out if you're interested mm-hmm. is all about basically Apollo Creed's son Mm-hmm. Kind of almost revamping the story of the first Rocky film in him with a new generation. Right. So it begs the question, what is this? Is this a spinoff or is it a sequel? Now, it's not written by the St- Stallone. It's written by other people. It's mm-hmm. the guy who did, the guy who directed and wrote. Uh, Fruitvale, Fruitvale Station. Fruitvale Station, mm-hmm. which is a really great movie in its own right. Mm-hmm. And But then Rocky is a supporting character. Right. But at the same time, though, it's like if you're going to have Rocky in it at all, Obviously, there's a new generation. He's in the, in the 70, going to be in the 70s soon. So, obviously, it's a new generation. So, he's going to be a supporting character. But you're filling out, wrapping up. Where is there to go in Rocky's life? Mm-hmm. He is basically an older man. Mm-hmm. And he has to take on the mentorship role. And from what we know about it so far, I don't think I'm spoiling anything. Because if you're watching the trailers, that's why everybody's talking about it. Rocky is basically being hinted at, at 
having cancer and going through chemotherapy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This is in the set in the long saga of his life because we watch this character's life from thirty to his sixties. You see, this is the last stage of his life, so maybe death comes into it. We don't know yet, mm-hmm. but still, this would be. It still does up. tease a fact very, very well. It, it sounds like <laughs> right. a new franchise, a new trilogy is starting to begin a little bit. Maybe, maybe. I mean. I prefer. Th- I hope they don't do another another franchise because that would just be like, mm-hmm. yeah. I don't know how how I don't know how popular boxing films are going to become. I mean, films in this day I, and age, I, I recently caught a Southpaw uh, recently, and um, it's not a great boxing film. It's a good one, but I mean, it kind of shows that you know mm-hmm. some boxing films over the years started to really deteriorate and whatnot. Well, it deteriorated with the popularity of boxing films. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it's been a long time since there was a real, like, popular, popular boxing film. Well, yeah, because that didn't do as well as the box office. It's probably good. What did it do, like, $14 million or something like that? Yeah, it didn't do too well. I mean, mm-hmm. Jay Hall got a lot of uh, claim for that, but, you know, mm-hmm. it didn't do too well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was a good movie, but at the same time, I don't know if the popularity is there as it used to be. So yeah. they tried to revamp him some other way. Still, though. You know, it's a very unique type of wrestling. It's mm-hmm. not like wrestling like John Cena. Oh, does. oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. but like, or any other type of wrestling. But, you know, right, right, it's, right. it's cool. I mean, yeah, it's cool. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's so not, yeah, but so, I mean, those boxing movies always kind of parallel as like a metaphor for life. So that's why in cinema yeah, kind of it works. Because yeah. um, if you see Stallone, he kind of made his name off that kind of like whole philosophy and then yeah. goes and does the uh, action. They've pictures. tried to steer into like other lanes and whatnot. Like, right. You know, with the hurricane mm-hmm. and whatnot and everything. But anyway, yeah. Oh. So, I mean, that's one thing I'm just saying. I think it's more of like a legacy like Rocky sequel. That it is more of a spinoff. I mean, uh, yeah, it is a spinoff because you're going to a different vamp, but you're also completing the story of the Rocky character, which I think is going to be interesting. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I want to talk about this uh, popcorn time before we wrap up here. Uh, basically, with popcorn time, all right, it's basically, uh, what was this? Uh, a streaming uh, website, Streaming right? website, yeah, it's like Netflix, only it's for free. And I think you get equally as large as a uh, library here as you would on Netflix, only on to spend sp- yeah. like eight dollars every month. It's about every streaming site is free. I mean, and then here's a good little tech question here, really. Right. Um, not to not that this is a tech show, but more or less for someone who's streaming, right? Yeah. Is it reliable? Like the people who like develop this thing, and I mean, like, is it like I know? Do you have to more... like worry about a lot of commercials and anything? Yeah, no. is there a commercial? Really? No, you don't. No, yeah. no commercial. Because no. every streaming site I went to, I've had to deal with them commercials and stuff. Like, oh yeah, you know, the pop ups with like little pause, you know, like the State Farm on the other side, State Farm. or just like some anime on the other. Oh, <laughs> Just like mm-hmm. something for like free live cams or yeah something yeah like free that. live cam <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean it's like it, it's, oh, it's obnoxious it becomes obnoxious after a while no but this yeah, is like yeah, if you yeah. download it you have this little cute little popcorn box with the little eyes yeah the cutest logo it, ever known to man <laughs> and <right>? movie making <laughs> so uh, you, pre- you click on it and you basically have this entire library full of movies and TV shows and it's been really big but the thing is if you're watching it for free it's all legal so these are basically, with Netflix, what they do is that they basically license movies to be able to have them in their library. With this, you can be open to almost, not every movie in the world, but a lot large volume of movies mm-hmm. for free. Now, this is what's crazy, though. I mean, here's the thing. If you're readily able to put out work, you know, if you're a person that makes a movie and you put it out onto the Internet, then that's open to anybody to watch. Now, granted, you want to make money off of it, mm-hmm. so that's an issue. But I kind of like the idea of where, like, you know, this is where this, where the world's going with streaming of movies as opposed to just going to a theater and watching them. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously, without the licensing rights, without paying them, it is illegal, but still. Well, it's yeah, here's one fun fact about this. I was reading this up on uh, online, and yeah. for Popcorn Time, it actually got shut down in 2014 and right. rebooted into a .io instead of, like, a dot, I, I don't know if it was .com originally, or, or, like, a big, like, network name, oh, like so .org.net. Oh, it's sort of like what happened in movie 4K. Exactly. Or from 2K to 4K. Now they have, like, domains that have .io, mm-hmm. right. like, .so, um, like, even mm-hmm. stuff like that. But that's where they're, like, putting their main streams, right. uh, which is interesting. And apparently... It doesn't ever go down, which hmm. is which is a crazy question because you know, like obviously they're pirating. It seems like it's a crazy, yeah. somewhat illegal sting, uh, thing to right. do. But you know what? It's still up, still up. I mean, I mean luckily they have a big library exactly. where they when they actually find the film, you know, they can license. So people see that. But yeah. I report, you decide, right? In the whole regard. <laughs> or if, I sort of think, just think it's funny. if you like it that way, go watch them that way. So. Uh-huh. But still, Netflix is legal. That's cool. Mm-hmm. But. Anyway, so when we get back, we'll talk uh, about movies and, by the way, what are the movies we're reviewing? Well, we got two heavy hitters. We got Black Mass, we got Everest, and Maze Runner Scorch Trials. Why <sighs> films? We'll find which ones were really good and which ones just yeah. terrible. But we don't know yet. But 
Joy, what do we have for news? Well, Johnny Depp is seeing backlash for his role in Black Mass. The Green Inferno is arriving just in time for Halloween and a Christmas special you wouldn't believe. For all that and more, stay tuned to The Screening Room. Oh, yes. When we get back, we'll have more views here on WRHU. Controversy surrounding Johnny Depp and his starring role in Black Mass as Whitey Bulger, one of New England's most notorious crime bosses. James Whitey Bulger headed the Irish Mafia from the late 70s to the late 90s. Bulger is currently serving two life sentences for over 30 charges, 11 of which being murder. Black Mass highlights Bulger's corrupt dealings with the FBI in a dirty deal to bring down the Italian Mafia. Black Mass currently has 76% certified fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes. However, the film isn't receiving the same amount of praise from the families of those who were victimized by Whitey Bulger. The families believe the film uses false representation of Whitey's family life to humanize the mobster in a way that downplays his crimes. According to reports, Bulger refused to see Johnny Depp to help him prepare for the role. Warner Brothers Black Mass made its national release on Friday. Horror fans have no fear. Eli Roth's long-awaited release for The Green Inferno is just around the corner. The horror adventure film tells the story of a group of student activists who go to the Amazon to save the rainforest and soon become a part of the local cuisine. The Green Inferno encountered several production delays during the initial launch, but is now more than ready. It appears Roth was inspired by classic gory cannibal horror flicks of the 70s due to the film's extreme violence and dark humor. The Green Inferno will be released in theaters this upcoming Friday. Speaking of Friday, 90s rapper, actor, and producer Ice Cube will star as Ebenezer Scrooge in Tim Story's modern take on A Christmas Carol. The film is titled Humbug. Ice Cube's character is a successful but stingy estate mogul who visited, who is visited by none other than the ghost of past, present, and future to give him a refresher course in finance. Humbug is written by Todd and Earl Jones. Ice Cube and Tim Story have partnered before in the productions of Barbershop and Ride Along. Both Ride Along 2 and Tim Story's Humbug carry 2016 release dates. That's all the news we have for today. Stay tuned for this week's box office review. And we're back here on the screen room with Thomas Martin, DJ Galski, and of course, we have to do our reviews of this week's movies. Mm -hmm. And of course, so let's start. What do you want to start out with, Brother Wells? Oh, the Black Mass Man. Black Mass? Okay. Oh, yeah. The story of Whitey so Bulger. This, yes. This is the story of Whitey Bulger, one of the most notorious gangsters in U.S. history. And he basically was one of the few gangsters ever to have made a deal with the FBI. And they basically played them for years, and he was a fugitive for a long period of time. And, uh, Let's go right now to when the alliance is made. You got two minutes. I mean, I'm going to come right to it. I, I have it on very good authority that Gennaro and Julio is planning to have you murdered. Is that so? And how does he plan to achieve that? That's the kind of information that my side gets. And that's the kind of information that we can provide. John, do you know what I do to Raz? It ain't Raz. So, this is um, actually, first of all, I gotta say thanks, thank you to Johnny Depp for saving his career. Yes, and he's actually back in movie. rare form. Great yeah. redemption here, oh, absolutely. Oh my I mean, because for years he was playing like a Tim Burton parody he, of himself. He was playing just a ton of eccentric characters that we've seen enough already. So, and I mean, good for him for the creativity there. But he has really made a substantial film in my mind since mm -hmm. um, Sweeney Todd. And that came out in like 2007, mm -hmm. which is actually great music. I love it. But he does a great job here. He really yeah. transformed himself into Ab a completely different person. Absolutely incredible. He was brutal, sinister, vicious. I mean, those blue eyes made me think of like <laughs> an animal, like a beast. Like, like, a, yeah, like, like a, a soulless leech. beast. Like a le yeah, like a beast and a leech and everything like that. Yeah. Yeah. No, he uh, really does transform himself, and it's really refreshing to see. I mean, literally, even with the contact lenses where he has his blue eyes, you mm -hmm. do not see him. Yeah, in and those are not his regular eyes or right, whatever. Right. So, so that was phenomenal. Yeah. That was phenomenal. Yeah, no, it just was absolutely incredible. The screenplay was fantastic. I mean, I've never seen a gangster film. All right, now, like, they, that's the thing. Yeah. The only issue I have with the screenplay here, mm -hmm. and while I do applaud the acting, because every, everybody from George Edgerton's greatness, even yeah. Corey Stahl, when his small yeah. role yeah. Mm -hmm. um, 
phenomenal. And even the cinematography, I lo love that. Everything's mm -hmm. phenomenal in here. But the only issue I really have with it is that you don't really have much of a protagonist and antagonist. You're not really rooting for anybody. And the only issue, I wish to see Corey Stahl <laughs> character. Oh, I got this, got this. The story of Corey Stahl <laughs> character <laughs> in, in there, where he plays the guy who could possibly ruin Joel Edgerton and Jimmy um, Bol Bolger's, basically, alliance. Doesn't come in until half, at the end of the movie, mm -hmm. and I wish that was brought in earlier into the movie, so there was a little bit more tension of whether or not there was more of a conflict of what was going to disrupt what was going on. Well, that's the thing with some biopic films is that there's just some stories that are just so unusual that you know you won't actually see the traditional protagonist antagonist uh, thing that happens right there. Right, but I wish they had it there, or at least extend the movie a little bit longer so you can actually have some more tension and conflict in there. I mean, I will admit they they had room to extend. There actually was more to Whitey's history. I looked mm -hmm. him up, and there's actually more that he did that they could have went with i mean it all goes back to the writing and this is not again this isn't a bad script mm -hmm. by no means but i just wish there was some a little bit more tension in there right. that was going on also i kind of wish that this is like other aside from the gangster pictures they actually focus him more on like a psychopath as like just a killer yeah i wish yeah. i knew a little bit more about his organization mm. like maybe in like casino how they explain like the entire again life. you know the boston gangs they were a little more unpredictable and whatnot but nonetheless uh this is a great film i actually think this is the first definite oscar contender for best picture and best actor for depth really you think so and even best supporting actor for edgerton okay well. no no edgerton was really good and i like how there's even some humor with them you can't you can't help but laugh at gangsters honestly well, there was like here. a tiny bit of humor i mean for the most part it was dark oh it yeah, was yeah. Very but, dark. It was like, but still it was like yeah. a dark Cause comedy it was darker than i expected but yeah so again like still i don't know if it's like memorable but i still like it so i still say hey it's a history it. lesson you know that's true it's very good history lesson mm -hmm. um that's cool and then our next picture is which it's the uh, Maze Runner. Maze Runner? Okay. Yeah. So basically, this picks up right where the last film left off, and Thomas and the rest of the Galators, they've escaped from the maze, and they get sent to like a refugee camp almost, but uh, they soon quickly realize that something is off, and then Thomas realizes that Wicked still has them in their grass, and they basically make an escape out into the Scorch, which is basically a wasteland full of just all kinds of crazy stuff. And uh, let's go to the clip. Do you ever get the feeling the whole world's against you? Three questions. Where did you come from? Where are you going? How can I profit? Don't all answer at once. I'm here for the mountains. Looking for the right arm. <laughs> Love a little cackle there. Love a little cackle there. Uh, the only issue I have with this picture really is that it's terrible. Is, yeah, it's worse than the first one. Uh, nothing gets explained from like the questions you had in the last one. You're like, mm -hmm. oh, maybe they'll explain it in the second one. No, nothing gets explained. It's all terrible. It, it's all it terrible. actually gets to a point where it becomes like a Resident Evil ripoff when they get out into really? the Scorch. Because yeah. uh, that's what I was thinking, Resident Evil the whole time. Yeah, not good. And the grown-ups showed up, the youngins, in this one big time. Yeah, yeah, really bad. Yeah, so, you know, this was absolutely terrible. Mm -hmm. Do not see it. This is a waste of time. Okay, yeah, don't see it. Our last picture actually is, in fact, the actual... What was that? Everest. Mm -hmm. So let's get right to that. What is that about? Basically, uh, this highlights the 1996 uh, Everest disaster where about eight different international uh, climbers tried to climb up Everest. They did, but then the descent down was a pure nightmare. And uh, a lot of people lost their lives. And let's go to the clip. It hurts. It's dangerous. It destroys relationships. It's costing you all a small fortune. Are there any negative aspects? Yeah, to this I got to ask the question. You know, I do. Why? Why? Because it's there! That's why. Thank you, Mr. Mallory. <laughs> Come on, guys, I'm, I'm serious. Doug, tell why? Me. Come on, tell them about the kids. What? So the only issue I have with this movie, too, is that I wish I got to know these characters a little bit better. Yeah, that was my problem, too. They shifted more to just the views of the mountain and everything, but we didn't get really much of the characters. Yeah, and, and just uh, here's the problem with the picture, too. It's just that it goes along with the whole, let's put a bunch of uh, well-known names in here. Mm -hmm. This was a great book. Let's make it into a movie. Let's put mm -hmm. a bunch of well-known names in here. Let's make it really dynamic and make it 3D, and it'll be a box office hit. Is it? I don't know. So I'll tell you in a second. Yeah, the uh, well, yeah. I mean, the acting was solid and whatnot, but yeah, yeah we yeah. should have seen a little bit more development. Um, but the cinematography was great. Really liked it. Um, suspenseful, and it's decent. So it's decent, I'd say so. go see it. Yeah, I say it too. 
But if you not want to, let's not yeah. do that. Anyway, so that's what we thought of movies. Let's see what you guys thought of Joy, please, box office. Coming in at number one this week is Maze Runner, The Scorch Trials, grossing eleven million on its opening weekend. Next up is Black Mass, which grossed eight point eight million and also opened this weekend. At number three is The Visit, which made three point five million this weekend and thirty four point five million overall. Followed by The Perfect Guy, grossing three point million this weekend and thirty four point seven million overall. Finally, at number five is Everest, which grossed two point three million on its opening weekend. Filling in for Haley on WRHU's The Screening Room, I'm Joy Jones. Now it's time for the Screening Room's Top 10. All right, people. So Black Mass featured actors that pulled up, put on a Boston accent and decided to take a look at the most impressive accent from actors who aren't from that country or from wherever. Uh, so at number 10, we've got Nicole Kidman. She's originally from Sydney, Australia, but in The Interpreter, she put on a South African accent. At number nine, we got Rachel McAdams, who's originally from Canada, but she put on a German accent for A Most Wanted Man. At number eight, we got James McAvoy, who's originally from Glasgow, Scotland, but put on an American accent in Wanted. At number seven, Jeremy Renner, who put on a Boston accent in The Town, and he's originally from Modesto, California. At number six, we got Viggo Mortensen, who was born here in New York, but even though he's Danish, and he put on a Russian accent in Eastern Promises. At number five, we got Meryl Streep's Danish accent in Out of Africa. Streep was born in Summit, New Jersey. At number four, Margot Robbie, who's originally from Gold Coast, Queensland, Australia, and she put on a Brooklyn accent in The Wolf of Wall Street. At number three, Leonardo DiCaprio's Zimbabwe accent in Blood Diamond, and he hails from Hollywood, California. At number two, we got Sasha Barrett Cohen's Kazakhstani accent from Borat, even though he's actually from Hammersmith, London. And at number one, we got Meryl Streep, again, from New Jersey, who put on an English accent in The Iron Lady. And that is your top ten. It's amazing, isn't it? So amazing with those accents. Yeah, I love how they actually, like, yeah, British dude actually plays an English dude, like American dude. It's amazing. Yeah. It's funny. It's funny. Anyway, if you missed any part of today's show, please, you can probably check it out on Screw Room TV sooner or later, and we can see our bright, smiling faces here on this yes. Sunday morning, right? And also our beautiful studio, because I love this stuff. And, of course, we'll have, like, another, like, this will be on our website later, the screen room, WRHU.com, later on mm -hmm. today, and that will be a good time. But please, tune in next week for another exciting episode of Fun and Adventure in All That Is Cinema here on 88.7 FM, WRHU, on with the screen room with Tommy Smart and DJ Gowski. I'm Tommy Smart, king of the movie business, signing off. And remember, tune in next Sunday on 88.7 WRHU-FM. You just left the screening room with Tommy Smart and DJ Gowski.